uh, talk is uh, uh, in some way complementary with uh, La Infant's uh, talk of yesterday. La Infant's presented something about uh, prefixes, and I'm going to talk about suffixes. How does uh, evidence from uh, languages with conservative morphology in a Sino-Tibetan family, to what extent are these relevant to uh, studying Chinese? Um, before I start, let, let me say a few words uh, about methodology. Um, I think that uh, in the Sino Tibetan family, the two groups among the 30 uh, uncontroversible subgroups of the family um, that have the most complex morphology are uh, Jarunik, on the one hand, that uh, in fact has been talking about yesterday, and Kiranti, on the other hand. Um, there is evidence that I cannot go into too much today that uh, these languages present archaic features that some of this morphology at least is uh, uh, to some extent ancient uh, and cognate between these two, these, these two families. Um, and although um, the number of cognates between Yarongik, uh, Kiranti and Chinese is very limited, I mean, uh, uh, in Yunfan's presentation he, he tried to uh, put together all the cognates and we have less than 200 cognates between uh, Yarongik and Chinese. So th these languages are not so useful to uh, reconstruct actual uh, 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 clusters, for instance, or uh, uh, confirm many hypotheses about clusters in all Chinese because the vocabulary is common vocabulary is so limited. But on, on the other hand, the rich morphology of these languages can be a guide to um, at least uh, create hypotheses uh, to interpret the morphology of all Chinese. I believe that uh, when studying a language whose morphology has been uh, eroded, it, is, uh, it becomes impossible to uh, really uh, recover the meaning of the lost affixes only on a language internal basis. I, I think it's uh, when we look at Indo-European, for instance, if you uh, study a language like Albanian or Armenian, uh, you can know uh, the entire literature by heart. You will never be able to etymologize any word if you don't have uh, knowledge of Sanskrit uh, and Greek. Uh, you, you always uh, <coughs> you need to understand the basic morphological structure of proto language and try to recover the traces of it you can find in languages that have less conservative uh, typology, even if they are not closely related in uh, Stammbaum. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about one topic, the S suffix, because it's the most, uh, <coughs> uh, the most uh, conspicuous suffix uh, in all Chinese. I think there are several distinct suffixes, actually, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that correspond to Chu Shan. Um, I hope I can be forgiven not to uh, uh, present an exhaustive uh, um, uh, references on, on this topic. Uh, for instance, I, I didn't quote uh, Sun Yu, but I, I was aware of its existence thanks to Kong Kong Xun, but uh, um, I, I will just uh, uh, use da da Downer's uh, uh, study of the topic. So, uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, Downer um, collected um, examples of uh, uh, derivation by Chu Shan Tong, and he found eight different types. Uh, with uh, widely uh, distinct uh, uh, semantic uh, properties, uh, as you can see in section 2. And his uh, interpretation of this um, diversity in the meaning of this suffix is that uh, um, the, the Chushan tone derivation, as he calls it, uh, was not really um, the, f the trace of an inflectional system, but simply a way to create new words, as you can say in, his, uh, in, uh, in the quote taken from his article. And this view <coughs> has been repeated by several other authors. Um, I think that this view, at the time when Downer wrote, was uh, perfectly uh, uh, I mean, uh, legitimate, but um, with uh, 50 years later, it's easy, of course, to criticize uh, previous uh, authors. But I think that uh, uh, such a view, um, I I if you hold a view like that, then 
that's it. You can't go any further. And uh, uh, basically, you say that uh, uh, morph any study of Chinese morphology is pointless. Uh, I mean, that, that's. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that's uh, an, an, a view that, in some way, leads nowhere. Um, at least we should try to uh, to interpret the remnants of morphology in Chinese using our knowledge of more conservative languages. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Of course, the, the comparison I'm going to present in this paper uh, are not, I, I have no, make no claim that they are all true. I'm just presenting a series of possibilities. And I leave it up to the Chinese specialists to, uh, to, to determine to what extent they, they, can be, uh, 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 they can be accepted or not. So, um, Downer found eight types. I, I'm not uh, uh, aware of, uh, I, I, since I haven't read in detail uh, Sun Yuan's uh, book, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know if um, re more recent work on, on this topic has discovered new types of uh, uh, new meanings for this derivation. But in any case, uh, the, the types uh, that Downer has uh, proposed are, are, quite, uh, are all uh, quite well attested. Uh, derivation from verb to noun. So it's not <coughs> explicit, but uh, there are very various types of nouns, actually. Uh, uh, like you have to be high and height, so it's an abstract noun. Uh, be at the place, so, but in some cases it's the, uh, the object of a transitive verb, or it may co correspond to the only argument of an intransitive verb. So uh, it, it's not, it, it, it seems to be um, used to derive various types of nouns, uh, it doesn't have a very specific meaning. Um, you can derive uh, a verb from a noun, there are also many examples of it, so it, the exact opposite of the previous one. And uh, the, the, the meaning of the verbs is also uh, quite uh, ver varied, you some, sometimes to use an implement uh, as you have in this pillar. Um, you have many examples of causative. Uh, in the case of buy and sell, it's not really a causative, but in any case, many languages in the world use causative markers to derive words like sell or borrow from, from buy. That's a well-known uh, situation. And you have uh, a few examples, like ha and ha, to, to like from to be good, which are not really causative. Uh, they are more like what I have called using the Arabic tradition, tropative, so to consider something to be good. Uh, and uh, there, there is evidence, for instance, in the language languages that the causative can also be used in some cases with a tropative meaning. Yeah. Uh, there are examples of applicative. So applicative, uh, um, by applicative, uh, uh, I mean you take an intransitive verb, and you derive a transitive verb from it, uh, and uh, unlike in the case of a causative. In a causative, if you take an intransitive verb and you causativize it, the object of the transitive verb, the cosy, corresponds to the subject of the intransitive verb. Okay? So, uh, uh, sit, I sit, uh, uh, to make someone sit, the, the, the person who sits is the, the the object of the second, of the causative verb. In the case of an applicative, the argument that you add with the derivation course is um, the object, <coughs> to, say, to put it. It can, it can refer to, uh, and, you, and, and the subject of the derived verb correspond to the subject of the original verb. Okay? Uh, cause it, uh, I will show you more concrete cases using living languages to, to explain what I mean by applicative for those of you who uh, I'm not familiar with that. Just give the example of <coughs> can you run and outrun. Yeah, but uh, uh, you have a few uh, lexicalized applicative like verbs in English, German, you have a few, few examples like that. It's not productive in any European language, but uh, some, some language, in some language family it's quite productive. Um, five, you have this restricted meaning uh, kind of uh, category which appears to be a catch-all for various things and I, I won't attempt to uh, discuss it more. Uh, you have passive, so passive would be the exact opposite of uh, 
of uh, the, 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 the causative. And uh, you have quite a few examples. And you also have, uh, not, Darnold did not use this word because it wasn't invented when he wrote his article, antipassive. What is antipassive? Antipassive is to derive an intransitive verb from a transitive one. Okay? But the, unlike the passive, where the only argument of the intransitive one corresponds to the patient of the transitive verb, in the case of antipassive, the only argument of the intransitive verb corresponds to the subject. So, uh, to put it bluntly, simply, uh, like in French, uh, in, in French you have uh, use of, uh, of the reflexive uh, in antipassive like fashion. Um, uh, with some verb like uh, battre, battre to beat someone, se battre to, uh, and to, to fight, uh, which uh, is intransitive, which works intransitively, let's say. Okay. In French, it's very, you only have very few examples like that, with the uh, reflexive use as a, uh, to, to create this antipassive construction, but again, some languages have productive ways of making antipassive. In European languages, uh, generally, you don't have antipassive for one reason, because nearly all European languages have um, widespread agent preserving ability. So basically, most transitive verbs, for, whether in English, French, uh, you can uh, uh, omit the object, and it's interpreted as meaning an, uh, an unspecified object. So you can say, uh, I eat, uh, I eat an apple, I eat means uh, I have a meal. Yeah? Uh, but in languages that, uh, I in most languages of the world actually, if you omit the object, it will mean I eat it uh, with a specified object. And you need to have an antipassive marker to indicate that you have an unspecified uh, object. Yeah. So, uh, just to, you have a few examples of antipassive in Chinese. Then you have uh, adverb derivation, that very few examples, uh, but uh, two, or just the three or four. And uh, a form in com compound. So uh, you, you have in some cases the first or the second element of a compound with a tuition added. Okay, so indeed, if you, at a first glance, it, it looks like what Dr. Down says that it's just a, a big mess and will never be able to solve at anything. And it's just, uh, let's, let's do something else. Well, uh, I, I, I'm just going to try to propose a series of etymologies in other languages. So, <coughs> previous colleagues have already pointed out some of them. Uh, the first of them, uh, following Audrey Cour, was a uh, uh, discovery of the the tuition comes from uh, s suffix. It's come, come from, from an s. Was a forest, and uh, well, of course, there are many other scholars have. Uh, built on, on, on that uh, idea. Before I go any further, I will propose, uh, I will start by proposing a, a sound law, a p potential sound, and, and you're free to criticize and to comment that. <coughs> In Tibetan, uh, do I, I first start with a typological example. In Tibetan, it's well known that in the present, what we call the present tense, whether it's proper or not to call it this way, I won't argue. <coughs> we have some, some, some transitive verbs <coughs> have a conjugation whereby you add either an S or a D, final D. And uh, all people who have worked on uh, Tibetan internal uh, uh, reconstruction agree that you have a sound law which tells you that, um, uh, can you put a pen somewhere? Uh, something to write on the plate there? Yeah. Oh, can you just have a pen Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So uh, if you look at the two examples, you have in depth, the tap, okay, to plant, or it's, it, this is a verb that has many meanings, but. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, so, when you when you have a verb ending uh, whose uh, root ends with pa, ma, uh, ge, and various others, uh, you end up with s. 
So let's say uh, um, this was from something like uh, n da d. Let, let's reconstruct it d for the for for the for t maybe whatever. And uh, the, the vowel r changes to a. When uh, you have a verb ending in, in a vowel, you, you, you still get the, the fronting of r to a, but uh, it remains d. So you have a dit, petas, to, to chase, so it comes from and da, and this t, this t that has a, a fronting uh, and fronting back. So that, this would be the rough protoforms for, uh, for, for, for the present tense forms I, I, I put here. Um, and, and thus, we have some law in Tibetan telling you that pta, uh, pta, kta, nta, etc., change to pse, kse, mse. Uh, and you, it's a fact that you don't have clusters in pta, kta, nta anywhere in Tibetan. The only possible final clusters we have in Tibetan, well, I won't talk about the Tatrak, but uh, with these consonants are with S. So um, let's, let's imagine for a moment that uh, in, since in Chinese the only final cluster we could reconstruct involves consonant plus S, and there are many of them. I mean, it's, it's striking that in any reconstructor of all Chinese, you get, you get S's everywhere. You get also R's everywhere. I mean, I, I think the, this is uh, a problem, I think, for all reconstruction of Chinese, uh, not specifically uh, Laurent's uh, or, or, or Schussler's or anyone else's. The, the communist opinion of, uh, of the, the present reconstructions well, uh, uh, reconstruct, I think, too many R's and too many S's. Uh, my, my view is that um, <coughs> we, we, maybe these, uh, the, the, the present reconstruction don't make enough uh, distinctions. Uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> one of the reasons is that uh, consonants different from S, from S and R have merged with, uh, with the original R's and S's. And um, from the present data, it's, it's not always possible to distinguish between them. But let, let's accept for the time being that T could change to S when it occurs as the element of a final cluster. At least, maybe not after all consonants, but maybe after some consonants. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, evidence in some languages of the family, especially Kiranti, for ex the existence of clusters like that. So it's not illegitimate to suppose that it may have been the case. If we do that, then we, we are entitled to compare uh, the final S in Chinese not only with uh, S suffixes, but also with T suffixes in other languages. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And you will decide for yourself whether you believe it's uh, reliable or not. So, let's go one by one. I, I won't discuss all the downers categories. I, I won't discuss the restricted meaning one, but most of the other ones. The first most obvious that was uh, discovered is the nominalization issue. Because in Tibetan we have a, it's not productive anymore, but we have quite a, a, a big series of, uh, of uh, nouns derived from verbs with an S suffix. I think this is completely uncontroversial. Uh, and there are even a few <coughs> examples that are probably connected to Chinese. Yeah, uh, actually there is a typo on uh, Middle Chinese, of course. It should be, uh, there is no IG, IJ, it's the simple, simply I. Uh, oh yeah, I, I didn't uh, include the old Chinese, it's just uh, out of laziness. I, I should have added it in, in the eventual version, I, I will add them. But uh, I think for, uh, you can try to figure out for them yourself. Uh, I use a slightly modified version of Middle Chinese, uh, of Baxter's Middle Chinese. So I won't dwell too much on minimalization, as minimalization, because I think it's quite uh, uncontroversial. I will talk a little more on the uh, causative applicative. Okay, so for the causative applicative, there is quite 
there is good evidence throughout the scientific family of T suffixes that derive applicative or causative verbs in various languages. Uh, uh, it's mainly in Chianti language that you have a lot of them, uh, but uh, you, you get a few examples in, in many unrelated branches, including Yarmouk languages. In Tibetan, there aren't many good examples, but uh, um, so um, uh, Libu is probably the language that has the best uh, cases of uh, the, 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 because it, it distinguishes very clearly an S causative and an S applicative. So here taking data from Boyd Mikalowski, so these, these are the root forms. Uh, it's not the actual way these forms are pronounced because they always occur with suffixes. And um, I, I won't go into the uh, morphophonology of it. It's <coughs> not relevant to the present uh, talk. You have an intransitive verb, harp to weep. You can derive from it a causative verb, harps, with an S suffix, to cause to weep. And an applicative verb, like here you see the difference, weep, mourn, fall. Huh? In the case of cause to weep, the, the person who weeps is the patient. It corresponds to the, the, uh, uh, the subject of the intransitive verb. In the second case, the applicative derivation, the uh, person who weeps is the uh, agent corresponding to the, uh, to the subject of the intransitive verb. So you see the, 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 the different relation between the causative and the applicative derivations within this language. There, it's it's um, difficult to, to claim that it's productive in any Kiranti languages in the sense that you cannot as far as I know, apply to long words, but you know, in, in some in some way, uh, these uh, the Kiranti languages. You have to understand that in Kiranti, verbs are a um, a closed class, large closed class. But uh, you only have seven hundred or eight hundred verbs, and that's all. And you cannot create new ones. You you barely can borrow verbs. So well, you can borrow a few, but uh, it's it's really. It's, it's, it's completely different from Yarongik, where anything can be turned into a verb. Yeah. So, um, the fact that we don't have examples of, for instance, Nepali verbs to which these are added is not really, uh, does not really indicate that these uh, derivations are, are dying. Uh, so, outside of Kiranti, we don't have a uh, nice example. So, I, I'm going to in order to make you understand the meaning of these suffixes, I I'm going to show you a few more from Kali, language on computer and field work. So here are examples of applicative in Kali. So uh, for instance, you have uh, um, be angry, bhult, to scold, to be angry at someone. Okay? Rit, laugh, rit, double T, laugh at. Uh, 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 well, let, that's again a root form. It's not pronounced like that. It's called dry. <laughs> if you use it in a third uh, uh, Then, brot to call. Actually, it may be a, 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 a cognate with the fail to bark. Uh, I don't know. Uh, whatever the, the R is. What, uh, no idea what the R is doing here. <coughs> so, basically, these verbs <coughs> um, uh, add a, um, either the recipient of something or a, a, the stimulus of a feeling. Uh, to be frustrated, to be frustrated from something. So either it's say a feeling, and you uh, the, you have the experience uh, which corresponds to the subject, and you add the, the with the with the suffix you add the uh, the, the stimulus. Uh, the causative T can also be used in Kali to express cause -a causative. So you have examples like bull to run, bull to cause to run, and P calm, pit to bring. This one is interesting because you have <coughs> the only verb with a T uh, applicative uh, in, in, in Yarongik is, is the ri from we, and it's copied with this one. So uh, this is uh, evidence that uh, this derivation has some degree of antiquity. 
Um, now, in, in Chinese, the only proposal for, for a T applicative was uh, by Laurent. This, uh, oh, but, uh, I won't dwell too much on it. Um, I, but I think that one possibility to explain some of the causative or applicatives, uh, if you uh, accept the, the, the sound I proposed, would be the following. At some stage, you had uh, this sound law. Okay, uh, five minutes left. Okay. I overestimated <laughs> my time. Sorry. But that doesn't matter. So you had this sound law, and uh, uh, you, you had quite a lot of pairs between verbs with S suffix expressing applicative and uh, uh, intransitive verbs. And then, uh, since you also had a, a causative suffix S, uh, the, the distinction between applicative and causative is already quite tiny, in, in, even in, in language data, where, where this derivation is quite um, productive, became blurred. And the S causative the, the, was general, the, the S, the, the, the meaning, the causative applicative meaning, meaning of, of uh, what was extended. Uh, to uh, context outside of the application of this sound law. And uh, that's why you also have the S suffix uh, expressing cause, uh, applicative or causative with, uh, with, with verbs uh, in uh, open syllable. For the passive and anti passive, I think uh, now uh, we can propose a different uh, comparison. In Chiranti languages and um, also in various languages with relatively conservative morphology like uh, Toulon and like Maga, we have a, a C suffix or she suffix, depending on languages, that express reflexive. This reflexive has, it's the basic meaning, it's the most common meaning, but it has many additional meanings. It can be used for impersonal subject. In some of our cases, it's used for anti-passive. You have example seven and eight, Lope uh, Grendu, I'm disgusted by liches. Grem I feel disgust. So here you see that the subject of the, um, uh, of the reflexive verb corresponds to the subject of the transitive verb. Um, it, it also has, uh, so, um, um, so I think that, uh, uh, one possibility for the, um, for, for the use of tuition to express both the passive and anti-passive would be comparison with this, uh, with this uh, reflexive suffix. Uh, uh, yeah. um, for, for the remainder, uh, for the, the denominal use of S, uh, I think that uh, this is somehow of a problem for, for scientific comparison. The aunt to my, to the extent of my knowledge, no good example of S suffixes deriving verb from nouns. So whatever the explanation must be for Chinese, I, I think that Yarunik uh, or Kiranti uh, evidence is of little use. For the derivation of adverbs, uh, one possibility is the, um, the, the use of an S suffix, which appears to be old because it's shared by Yarunik and Kiranti languages, to, uh, which, whose original meaning must have been locative. Uh, it's, it's, um, a, uh, it's used in, in Tibetan, it appears as element in case markers, various case markers, in, including the ergative and the ablative. In the uh, Yarmulic languages, it's used mainly for, uh, for, for uh, locative with motion. And um, uh, I think that this can also can potentially be compared with the use of s suffix uh, of the s suffix in Chinese with the um, as an adverb de de derivation. So um, yeah, uh, for for the other ones, I don't think I have good uh, comparisons, but I, I hope that. Uh, mm, the, the comparison I've proposed today, I, I have to, f to, to stress that 
um, there is some degree of speculation here. I am not claiming that they are necessarily related to Chinese, but at least I think it's better to explore um, how the meaning of the derivation we observe in Chinese might be linked to living languages, mm. uh, rather than speculate from a Chinese internal perspective. And I hope that uh, well, we can comment on the proposal I've made here today. Thank you.